Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture. This week, we talk about how uh, Latinx folks relate to race. Um, and as you probably saw from the reading, it's um, always been a, a complex kind of um, relationship and um, there's a wide variety and a big spectrum within which um, Latinos tend to ident identify themselves racially. Um, so these are some of the various ways in which a race comes up for Latinos um, in terms of uh, indigeneity and indigenous history of Latinx, Blackness and Latinidad, uh, we read about uh, mestizaje, the history of racial mixing and how that impacts how people see themselves, uh, whiteness and Latinidad, and how uh, Latin America uh, sees ra race versus how the United States defines race and how those two different um, ideas around race come into conflict when uh, Latin American immigrants arrive to the United States. So this week we talk about most of these. We will dedicate next week to specifically talking about Blackness and Afro-Latinidad. So in terms of uh, ind indigeneity, the readings talked about um, the various ways in which uh, Chicano uh, indigeneity is complicated. Um, first, there are indigenous tribes that cross borders between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, there have been indigenous tribes throughout the Southwest, um, and uh, there have been tense relationships between Spanish Mexicans and uh, in the Southwest and indigenous tribes. Um, the reading also talked about the politicized indigeneity as a result of the Chicano movement, um, which involved the reclaiming of Aslan and Aztec his history. But more recently, there's more discussions about settler colonialism as a way through which um, Native American uh, conditions in the United States are discussed. And so that has also raised the issue of um, other communities of color um, and how uh, Chicanx claims to indigeneity are um, complex and problematic um, because it, quite, it requires that Chicanos consider their own history as colonizers. So sort of this comes um, up against uh, the Chicano movement sort of identifying the Southwest as sort of the original lands of the Aztec empire. Um, and therefore that Chicanos have a claim to Southwestern lands, but how do we um, navigate that balance that with the reality that there have been uh, Native American tribes in the Southwest for hundreds of years, um, and that um, uh, Spaniards and Mexicans um, in that region were uh, involved in the violence and the displacement of those indigenous tribes. And finally, more recently, we have uh, the complexity of Latinx indigenous immigrants uh, that have come from places like Guatemala, so that we have now a number of um, indigenous folks from Latin America, um, like the Maya um, and other groups. Um, and so it sort of adds to the complexity of how do we talk about indigeneity in relation to this uh, population. The reading also talked about uh, mestizaje and sort of this um, uh, long uh, history that has existed in Latin America around different ways of seeing racial mixture. Um, so mestizaje refers to the cultural and biological mixing of indigenous and European populations in Latin America. Uh, the Latin American colonial practice was to incorporate the indigenous population through assimilation and marriage. Um, in the 1800s, particularly during the various independence movements in Latin America, Latin American intellectuals talked about uh, Latin American mestizaje, the, the, the mixture of, of races in the United States as a way to affirm their cultural difference from the United States. Um, Messi Sahiba has also been used by some Latin American intellectuals as an idealist narrative of Latin American racial mixture resulting in a new race. Um, <clears throat> and this has been used um, uh, 
by certain Latin American nations as a way to create national unity in places like Mexico, for example. Um, and then the reading also talked about um, how uh, in more recent years, how uh, particularly for um, Latinx populations in the US, how they have taken the idea of mestizaje and um, complicated it. And one of those ways has been through Gloria Saldua's theory of a new mestiza consciousness, where she was searching for a theory that could adequately grasp the particular experiences of living along the border um, in particular, uh, where you feel the tension between the cultures of Mexico and the United States. Um, she uses the idea of mestizaje as the embodiment of cultural, racial, and historical mixture as an identity that captured her own experiences as a Mexican-American woman whose family has lived for generations along the border. So for her, developing a mestiza consciousness means having an awareness of these various mixture, mixtures that exist and that she embodies and using that standpoint to look out into the world. So she took the, this idea of mestizaje and um, sort of readapted it to her reality as a border Chicana um, and as a way to think about um, and, and identify from an intersectional perspective and being able to claim all the different uh, social and cultural uh, identity mixtures that many people have. Um, <clears throat> so she wasn't looking at it just uh, uh, only from a racial mixture um, perspective, but also thinking about the mixture of identities. So she also talked about includes in the mestizaje, being a woman, being queer, being Chicana, and so on. Um, and how do all those identities sort of come together, right? So that's sort of the way that she looked at mestizaje. Now, in talking about how do Latinos relate to whiteness, this has been an ongoing complicated conversation. Um, because when we think about race in terms of skin color, if that's the only way we look at it, um, then uh, a lot of uh, Latinx folks will just look at their skin color, their fair, uh, you know, uh, light skin, um, and they'll say, okay, then that must mean I'm white. But in a more complicated view of what race actually means, um, then that uh, 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 becomes a bigger question mark for people. Um, so in the U.S. definition of whiteness, um, whiteness provides uh, means providing certain rights and privileges to white people. Um, and uh, Mexican-Americans and other Latinos in the U.S. have had a very complicated history in terms of how to racially identify. So Mexican-Americans, um, when the Treaty of Guadalupe uh, took place, um, and those uh, uh, Mexicans that were already in the Southwest became incorporated into the United States. Um, they were legally defined as white um, because according to the um, laws at that time in 1848, only white people could be given citizenship. But here this treaty had given these people citizenship as, as well, American citizenship. And so that the way they interpreted that was, well, if we are giving Mexican-Americans American citizenship and citizenship is only allowed for white people, then that must mean that Mexican-Americans are white. And so for a very long time, uh, Mexican-Americans throughout the Southwest have sort of grappled with that idea of um, whether they should or should not claim their whiteness as a way to affirm their citizenship rights, right? But then that contrasts with their social experience where socially they were always treated as non-white. And we see that represented in this sign here that you saw through various establishments in the Southwest saying we serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans, right? So this is how socially they're experiencing um, how people are perceiving them as non-white yet legally, uh, they are being defined as white. And the other um, sort of uh, uh, another way in which sort of race gets complicated is on how uh, whiteness is perceived in Latin America, um, where on the one hand, there's this, this sort of celebration of mestizaje um, and a racial mixture and um, celebrating that Latinos come in, in all different, you know, variations of colors. Um, but at the same time, there is a prevalence for uh, um, uh, 
preference for whiteness, right? So through this idea of blanqueamiento or the idea of improving the race through mixing with Europeans or lighter, lighter skinned individuals. And this is something that we still see um, socially expressed um, throughout different places in Latin America um, and probably throughout uh, Latinx populations in the US as well, sort of the sense that if you're darker skinned, uh, the way to prove the race is to marry someone who is um, lighter skinned than you. Um, so that sort of ideology around whiteness still being um, preferred is definitely present there. Um, and then the reading also talked about how when you look at how people define in their sen in the census, in the U.S. census, there's sort of um, inconsistent way in which the Latinx population define themselves as white. And you really see this in the discussion of um, the census in uh, Puerto Rico or among Puerto Ricans that, you know, people in Puerto Rico will define themselves as white and Puerto Ricans in the U.S. won't define themselves as white um, or, or a less uh, percentage of, of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. won't define themselves as, as white. And part of that has to do with sort of this different way in which race is perceived. So in Latin America, you have the sense that um, race is skin color, right? And so you have this big wide spectrum of races. Um, and so if you're fair skinned or lighter skinned than someone else um, in Puerto Rico and you're asked what your race is, they'll say white because um, they're just purely basing it on skin color. Whereas for many Latinos in the US, they've come to understand whiteness as coming with certain privileges, privileges that they don't experience in their everyday um, social environments, um, like, like Mexican Americans did before. Um, and so they come to an understanding that um, they might be light skin, but that doesn't mean that they're white the way that American whites are white, if that makes any sense. Um, and so that sort of helps explain some of the inconsistencies that we see in how people identify in the census. It really depends on um, where they're coming from, what their perspective is, what their individual understanding of race is. Um, and so again, as I was saying, this gets um, explained a bit in the article about how Puerto Ricans um, define themselves. Um, and so Puerto Ricans and, and other Latin Americans define race within a large spectrum of white, brown, and black, where there are also multiple varieties of brownness as well. Um, and the reading talked about and showed some um, <clears throat> charts sort of listing all the different terms that are used um, in Puerto Rico to define race. Um, and there's a lot of categories for something in between white and black. <clears throat> uh, often for, Latin, for uh, Latin Americans and uh, Puerto Ricans, um, race is based on your skin color and not your ancestry. So for instance, in the US, race has been defined based on your ancestry. The whole um, uh, one drop of black blood makes you black. So it doesn't matter how light skinned you might be, um, if you have an ancestor um, who is black, then that it, by definition makes you black in the United States. Um, and so that's very different, right, than how Latin Americans perceive it um, based on um, skin color. Um, so Latinx resistance uh, to use categorizations of race results in a variety of racial self-identities, whereas more options have opened up in the US census, you see more people identifying um, as other, for example. Um, but this doesn't preclude the fact that there is a history of anti-Blackness in Latin America, as I mentioned before, in terms of the preference towards whiteness. Um, and that's the, and we also find that um, anti-Black uh, uh, history, right, sort of comes with um, and appears in Latinx um, <clears throat> communities in the U.S. as well. The other thing that adds to this complication is that the census has uh, defined Hispanics or Latinxes as an ethnic group that can be of multiple races. Um, and so that tends to um, confuse people because um, often when you ask Latinx people what race you are, they'll say Hispanic. Um, but Hispanic is enlisted under the racial um, categories in the census. It's a, it's it's listed separate. So it's one question asking, are you Hispanic, yes or no? And then there's the racial question um, where Hispanic doesn't appear at all. 
um, and there are all these other racial categories. So that tends to be a confusing um, experience for many Latinx people who sort of see themselves as Hispanic, covering both their racial and their ethnic identity. So that adds also to the confusion of uh, many Latinos, um, where you hear many folks talk about how they just don't know how to categorize themselves, particularly when it comes to forms, right, where they have those sort of racial questions, um, depending how they um, appear, how the question is formulated, um, it, it creates some confusion for people in terms of what box do I check, right, um, and also what's the significance of, of uh, marking one box versus another. Um, uh, the other reading that we had to do for today um, gives you more of a personal experience of um, racial identities and how one person in particular um, experiences sort of navigating their racial identity, but also how their racial identity relates to some of their other identities that they have. And so this piece is by Sherry Moraga. If you haven't heard of Sherry Moraga, she's a very well-known um, playwright, writer, um, uh, uh, essayist um, in uh, in the Chicano uh, community. And um, she's been around for a very long time, has written a lot of different things. Um, and so I wanted to share this particular piece because I think she um, sort of touches on the all of these complexities, right? Um, so she identifies as biracial um, and she talks about uh, her racial identity as being both Mexican-American and white. Um, and she talks about how her journey towards understanding and navigating her multiple identities has allowed her to gain a better understanding, not just of herself, but also of others and being able to create solidarity with others. Um, she talks about her difficulties navigating her biracial identity, being both Mexican American and white. Uh, she also discusses how this was difficult because of the internalized oppression that existed within her own family as a mother emphasized the value of her light skin. Um, for her mother, a way to overcome their poverty was to become as anglicized as possible. So you see there's sort of like the connection between uh, uh, class and race, right? That for her mother, the fact that um, Shady Moraga was uh, light-skinned, that she needed to sort of preserve that, right? And also become as anglicized as possible so that um, she could escape poverty, right? Um, she also discusses how because she could pass racially as white, it wasn't until she experienced being othered through her sexuality as a lesbian that she began to fully comprehend what it meant to be uh, othered racially as well. So she's able to sort of make this connection around um, being marginalized as a, a common experience across different identities. Um, she also begins to see the differences between types of language, where the language of her education was an alienating language, while her family language was filled with emotion and allowed her to express those emotions she'd, ex she'd repressed. So she really touches on um, all, the diff all these uh, different ways in which um, she has a much more complicated identity um, and also adds to it um, how to relate racial identity to class, to language, to family, um, and so on. And these are just a few quotes that um, I pulled out uh, from her essay that I think really captures um, the the role of fear and oppression, but also her philosophy around um, not just these ideas, but also how to create solidarity. Um, in the first quote, she says, the danger lies in ranking the oppressions, the danger lies in failing to acknowledge the specificity of the oppression. And so here she talks about the danger of ranking oppressions. Um, in other words, she's critiquing the way that sometimes people get into arguments over which group is more oppressed. Yet she doesn't suggest with her critique that we shouldn't discuss or acknowledge how there are differences in the various forms of oppression. So it's important to also acknowledge the specificity of each type of oppression without turning into a competition of which one is more oppressed than the other. Um, 
in the second quote, she talks about what the oppressor fears. He fears he will discover in himself the same aches, the same longings as, as those of the, pe of the people he has shitted on. He fears the immobilization threatened by his own incipient guilt. He fears he will have to change his life once he has seen himself in the bodies of the people he has called different. He fears the hatred, anger, and vengeance of those he has hurt. So here she undermines the, the power of the oppressor by exposing um, his fears. Fear as being at the root of oppression, not just that they might see themselves in those they oppress and thus their ideas about inherent differences would collapse, but also a fear of what would have to change in their lives in order to make room for the oppressed, right? So she really sort of um, digs deeper into um, what does oppression mean? Um, what does it mean for people who are uh, racist or sexist, right? Where, where is the resistance coming from? Um, and she identifies it as fear, right? Fear of themselves, fear of what it would mean for them um, to, to actually see people of color in an equal kind of way. The final quote, she says, I can't afford to be afraid of you nor you of me. If it takes head on collisions, let's do it. This polite timidity is killing us. In this quote, she's addressing a white women in particular of the mainstream feminist movement and how their own fears have gotten in the way of creating solidarity across race. In order to reach solidarity, both parties have to get over their fears of what may or may not happen and take the chance anyway. And I think that this can be extrapolated to not just, you know, relationships between uh, Chicana women and, um, and white women, but I think across the board, right, what does it mean to create solidarity um, with each other when clearly fear exists, right, um, among people who are different from each other, right? And so um, her, her message basically is feel the fear and do it anyway, right? We can't just let the fear get in the way. We might have to get into some head-on collisions, some real arguments, um, some difficult, right, um, kind of um, um, conversations, um, but it's worth, right, the difficulty. It's worth um, uh, uh, getting through the fear because at the other side is community, is solidarity. So this ends our lecture uh, for this week. I look forward to seeing um, your thoughts in the discussion posts. Have a wonderful week.